Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2024 Smart Buildings Exchange. My name is Carrie Mead, and I'm the Executive Director of the Smart Building Center. The Smart Building Center is a Seattle-based nonprofit organization that launched in 2017 through the collective efforts of several Seattle area business leaders. Over the past seven years, we've expanded from our local roots to hosting events that attract a global audience. Our growth is driven by our partner businesses, a dedicated team, and the increasing demand for smarter buildings that enhance productivity, reduce carbon emissions, support great interactive eco districts, and promote health and well being. This is our fourth annual Smart Buildings Exchange, and we're excited to bring together over 50 speakers and nearly 1,000 registrants from around the world. Our three day program includes two days of virtual sessions followed by an in-person panel discussion here in Seattle with recordings available for all sessions. Before we begin, I have a couple of housekeeping items to go through. Please use the SBX web app and Socio WebEx platform to, to access session links in the agenda. All sessions today and tomorrow will be live on Zoom. The final session on Thursday will be in person in Seattle, um, but will be recorded and available afterward for those who can't attend here. Most sessions are in Zoom webinar format, so attendees are not visible to each other. Sponsor breakout rooms will be in Zoom meeting format, allowing for interaction. The chat function is available to attendees, but we will not be monitoring it. So please use the Q&A function for all questions. Session recordings will be available online after the event. I wanna give a special thank you and shout out to our conference sponsors, the Washington State Department of Commerce, McKinstry, Seattle City Light, McDonald Miller, ATS Automation, Better Bricks, Overcast Innovations, <clears throat> Long, DB Engineering, Puget Sound Energy, and Alps Controls. Your support makes this event possible and free. And to our speakers and to all of you joining us today, it's truly inspiring to be a part of an industry at the forefront of innovation, working together to make our buildings smarter, cleaner, and more efficient. Thank you all for being here and for your commitment to these important goals. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote moderator, Ash Iwad, Chief Market Officer of McKinstry. With over 25 years of industry experience, Ash is responsible for evolving McKinstry's vision and leadership for a variety of related initiatives aimed at innovation in the built environment and oversees McKinstry's market development strategy. His extensive knowledge in the industry includes systems engineering, evaluation of sustainable ideas, development of alternative financing solutions, and optimizing and securing utility incentives and grants. Ash earned his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Massachusetts and a master's degree from the University of Washington. Ash is a registered professional engineer. In 2023, Ash was appointed by Governor Jay Inslee to the Board of Trustees for Western Washington University. He also sits on the boards of Washington STEM and Climate Solutions and serves as the Deputy Director for the Washington Roundtable. I'll hand it over to you now, Ash. Well, that was a lot to be said about me. Thank you. But, um, <laughs> Jerry, thank you so much. I'm so excited about this. this is, how many years in a row have we done this now? This is our fourth. Fourth. Oh, my goodness. And what a, what a great event. And are we still getting people all over the world? All over the world. I love that. Well, great. <laughs> Gary, thank, thank you so much. And I want to welcome everybody that's listening in. And um, I want to thank you all for joining uh, this session, this first session of the 2024 Building Smart Building Exchange. I am truly joined by an outstanding group. I'm going to do a brief name introduction. In a moment, we're going to have them do a longer introduction of themselves. Hi, Elizabeth. Nice to see you. Elizabeth is from the U.S. Department of Energy Loan Office. As a matter of fact, we're going to let her kind of share some very specific thoughts from DOE in a moment. Um, Scott, and I learned how to say his name very well here. So, Scott, if I get this wrong, don't laugh, okay? Stogsdill. Did I do that right? Stog, stog like Logsdill, right? Stogsdill from the Ryan Company. And uh, looking forward to hearing uh, from Scott, particularly as it relates to some great work they're doing around the federal IRA. Mark DeDon, a longtime friend of mine, uh, is from the Caspian Group. He's been helping the state of Washington think about different funding sources. And uh, hey, Molly, Molly McCabe is from Handon Tanner, and she's actually 
focus on a variety of different real estate development aspects. So we got quite a group with really quite a bit of great background uh, that I think uh, will really serve us well through this entire session. Again, I, in a moment, I'm going to have Elizabeth share some more specific thoughts, and then I'm going to have this panel do a better job than I just did introducing themselves in their focus areas. Let me start with some opening comments that I think um, frame this in my mind as I thought about this session. Um, uh, Terry uh, outed me. I'm, I'm a geek engineer. Uh, she failed to say that I actually decided to go back and get a grad degree in mechanical engineering. So when I say I'm a geek engineer, I'm a geek engineer. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm of the mechanical engineering flavor of geek engineers. My first job in the built environment was as an energy engineer. You know, psychometric charts, thermodynamics, solving technical problems, auditing for energy savings potential, fixing long-standing kind of comfort issues in a building. And, and oh my goodness, could I make a spreadsheet sing, an Excel spreadsheet. I, actually, I was about to say Excel, but you know, back then, I'll just date myself, it was Lotus 1, 2, 3, Mark. And I know Mark's probably the only one that, yeah, see, Mark knows what Lotus 1, 2, 3 is. Eventually, it became Excel. Nothing seemed more important to me than the actual technical solution to a problem. You know, it just seemed that everything else was not as important as being able to actually solve technically for a problem. Uh, but it wasn't very long into my career that I realized very specifically uh, that many elements had to come into harmony to actually uh, get not only a solution technically defined, but actually uh, to have uh, an end user, a building owner, a school district, a hospital, a university, a commercial office building actually make a decision to actually move forward with that technical sol solution. I learned further that there was really three things in particular that had to get worked out and aligned. The first was, uh, you know, again, I'm not sure in order of priority, but you did have to come up with some technical uh, or engineering solution to a problem. So you did have to do that. You know, those uh, solutions mostly nowadays are on shelf. They're available. Uh, they were um, available when I was in the industry as an engineer, but today uh, we really have advanced so much technology to help us uh, not only achieve uh, deep energy efficiency, localized energy production and storage, but even decarbonization in ways uh, that are really studied. So technically, you know, we got a lot of really great solutions. The second thing that had to come together is an agreement between the parties. You know, um, there are different kinds of agreements, but you had to have a way of actually getting everybody together uh, and maybe even one type of agreement that may nowadays lean on those that are delivering the solution to stand behind the solution. So not only can we technically solve for the solution, but you know the idea that the agreement amongst parties might actually uh, you know, move risk around in a way so that the parties entering into the agreement um, you know, found a way to balance out how not only the project would be delivered, but who would stand behind the long-term performance of the project. So that's gotten pretty interesting. You know, we got technical solutions and now we have a variety of different agreements. But the third area in particular was the financial or pro forma uh, solution. And essentially uh, the engineering of, of the financial construct, both in terms of short-term capital stack and long-term financial impacts. Now, I have to admit, and I suspect that you're all joining today, listening into this session, because you understand the importance of this financial engineering. And in some ways, as much as it pains me to say this, that the financial solution, the financial engineering in my career became most critical, most critical. So I, I want to just maybe offer up that, um, that in my career, those three, there are many, but those three, but in particular today, we're going to in particular talk a bit more uh, about the financial solution 
and how that's going to come together uh, are different. Today, it's very different than it's ever been, and here's why it's different. The amount of grant sources that always range from what utilities offer, now all the way through what the federal government has through a variety of different programs. Thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us. And even through private sources, let alone state sources, but private sources to include energy as a service to support these decarbonization efforts is plentiful. And the returns on investment are pretty well aligned with what most entities expect for returns on investment on these long hold assets. So more funding is available today. It's significant. We used to be excited when we used to get a 5% of a project covered by utility rebate. Now we're talking about funding that might extend and maybe cover as much as 30 to 50% of a project based on the federal IRA and other sources. So it's not only available, it's significant in magnitude. So here's my goal as the moderator as I turn it over uh, to Elizabeth here in a moment. And I, I, I'm looking forward to having this panel address some questions that I have for them um, and that you may also have for them using the Q&A function. But at the end, and here's the, here's the thing I'm curious about, I'm gonna ask the panel at the end to get them prepared. I, I wonder if you will believe what I believe today, which is that capital and funding is not the major constraint in decarbonizing the built environment. That's not the, the major constraint anymore. Used to be, but I'm not sure that it is today. So I'm curious about what this panel at the end after we dialogue will tell us is the major constraint. Okay, so um, thank you for letting me kind of set that up a little bit. I'd like to turn it over to Elizabeth for about five minutes or so. Um, Elizabeth, thank you for joining us. Very much appreciate you and, and the entire work of your group. Uh, but um, if you would, you know, help us kind of think through what specifically uh, DOE, particularly the loan office is doing, and then I'll get back and we'll introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sure, thank you so much, Ash. Let me just go over here. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you to kick off this exciting event. Uh, again, I'm Elizabeth bellis Wolf with the Loan Programs Office at the U.S. Department of Energy. And I'm excited to tell you about our office's work financing virtual power plants and decarbonizing the built environment. First, for those of you who may not be familiar with us already, the Loan Programs Office, or LPO, is a multi-billion dollar loan guarantor within the federal government. We help achieve commercial liftoff of key decarbonization technologies, like virtual power plants. For example, Earlier in the, in the first six months of this year, LPO has closed over $6 billion worth of deals, including 3 billion for a residential solar storage and EV charging VPP um, that I personally shepherded through our office, Sonova's Project Hestia. And we have a similar slide of all our commitments that we hope to close in the next six months with many, many more squares than you see here on the closed sheet. Virtual power plants, renewables deployment, and storage projects make up a hefty chunk of our pipeline of over 200 deals. And LPO can support smart building decarbonization projects that meet our eligibility requirements and criteria. Specifically, to be eligible for LPO support, the project must reduce greenhouse gas emissions, have a reasonable prospect of repayment, and utilize either an innovative technology, as we often see in the virtual power plant space, or utilize meaningful support from a state energy financing institution, such as a state green bank, or a housing authority, or an energy office that might be supporting this type of work. A smart building project would need to have significant capital expenditure costs that fall into one of our eligible cost categories, which include renewable energy generation, battery storage, and efficient end use technology. 
So that's a quick five minute or less overview uh, of what we're doing in this space. The one thing I wanted to add, since I understand you all be, will be focusing on building performance standards later, is that's a key element that we look at when we're looking at whether projects might qualify for us. We try to understand what costs are you incurring in order to achieve a certain building performance standard. Um, and so I think we can be very supportive of the kinds of projects that you all are developing. And I hope to hear from you all about what you're working on. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Ash, so we can go around the horn. Okay, that's great. Hey, Elizabeth, quick question for you before sure. we go back. <clears throat> Uh, what just for the audience what is a virtual power plant how do you define that that's a great question when we first wrote our liftoff report i think we came up with a list of it was at least two fingers and it might have been three fingers of the number of definitions we found we define virtual plant, power plant very broadly we're looking at aggregations of distributed energy resources that can be anything from solar storage, EV charging. Um, sometimes we see it with thermal capacity in buildings and some of the efficiency type projects, depending on how great interactive the building is capable of being and how it's harnessing that efficiency work, we can sometimes bring that in. Um, and what we're looking at is, can these resources be um, controlled uh, in a way that impacts their value to the grid? Um, ideally, we're looking at good services, but sometimes it's simple, you know, load reduction, load shifting. Um, we look for different standards depending on which of the programs the project is applying under. So if a project is coming in as innovative, we're really looking for something that hasn't been done more than three times in the US. Um, but for some of our, our other programs, like the state supported projects, you might not need to meet such a high threshold. Uh, and then you're just trying to show that it's still an energy project. It's not a real estate project because, of course, we are the Department of Energy. Yeah, interesting. Um, and and when you when you think of these different types of virtual power plants, uh, you mentioned a, a more residential site. Uh, but are, are these applicable to residential sites, commercial sites? Is it uh, is there a particular sweet spot that you're all looking for right now? We can we can do projects across the sectors, and in fact, in some cases, I think commercial um, and industrial properties may be easier than the single family residential space. And the reason I say that is because some of the federal requirements that apply to our projects include the Davis Bacon um, statute, which if you've worked on federal projects, you may be familiar with what it, what it means is that everybody yep. who's doing labor on the project, right, has to do weekly payrolls with certifications. They have to use electronic payroll systems, even for their subcontractors. Not all of the residential contractors that work in the single family space, frankly, have that big of a back office, right? So it can be sometimes more, more difficult. Whereas in the commercial and industrial projects, we see larger companies that maybe are more able to, to fit in with some of those federal requirements. But you know, for us, we're agnostic. We need to decarbonize all of the sectors, um, and they're all important. So, bring them all. Yeah, it's great that you say that because I can tell you, as McKinstry, you know, working with the federal government has been an absolute pleasure and the easiest thing we've ever done in our entire career. So, thank you for that. Hey, one last uh, one last question for you: Just um, are virtual power plants going to be ever more important as we contend with the EV and hyperscaling uh, data center scale up? Are, are these virtual power plants going to be critical to our future because of that? Absolutely. We really cannot handle the increasing load from data centers and frankly, even just from electrification of vehicles if we don't do a better job with managing our demand. Um, and that's even more so with all the intermittent renewables that we need to bring in to meet our decarbonization goals and taken together. It's really a it's a it's a requirement. We frankly cannot build fast enough, even if we wanted to only worry about the supply side to to meet all the increase in demand. <clears throat> and I'll note that a lot of states see that and are really interested in supporting and figuring out um, how they can help make these projects happen. I think we'll have to recommend to Carrie Mead and the Smart Building Exchange for 2025 to have a longer session on virtual power plants because I think that this is a really critical idea going forward. Elizabeth, thank Love you so that. much for sharing. And now let's turn back to our panel um, and uh, get some introductions going. So thank you so much uh, for that. 
Hey, hey, Molly, do you want to start introducing yourself and a little bit about your firm? What you oh, do? super. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ash. I, I'm so yeah. pleased to be here with everyone this morning. What a great panel. What a great group who are out in the, in the Zoom ether. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. I started my career as a banker. Uh, making construction loans on office buildings, hotels, apartments, um, and frankly, huge greenfield residential developments, um, building more than just neighborhoods, but cities. There's, there's a, for some of you, you may know the different, may you remember Rancho California and Temecula. Well, now it's a city. So I financed most of that in, back in my career. Um, and after that, I turned my hand to commercial mortgage-backed securities. So I spent a lot of my early career in finance and in structuring deals. Today, I build and invest in kind of future-proofed real estate and advise investors, corporations, and others to do the same. And how do they analyze sustainability? How do they analyze climate risk? How do they analyze resilience? And how does that drive through their economics? Because really, at heart, I'm a capitalist. Um, and so... Today, I'm currently working on a big development project, and I sort of as I look to the future, you know, a friend of mine said, well, you really should tell them that you're right at the cusp of putting out, um, looking for capital for this project, and so I'm kind of at net zero <laughs> today, and so um, that's where I am at this point is, is building, I'm building community, and building communities that are focused on sustainability, and, you know, for some, for some decarbonization is not a huge issue and you know, people don't think about it but for me it's really a value premise and a risk assessment and how do we drive that through so short for me that's great hey when you when you when you think about it from a risk perspective is it, it sometimes i've heard this phraseology and i'm trying to coin it right you know the either the brown discount or the green premium is that are you are you thinking about that when you're developing uh, or, or helping support the creation of these different communities? I am. And, you know, if you, I have never, I have never bought into the concept of, um, of sort of a green premium. I mean, the reality is the market is going to support what the market supports in terms of rent and other types of value, you know, sales. However, a class A building a quality asset that has lower risk will always harbor, always garner a higher premium in rent. And so therefore there is a brown discount. There is a, a discount on assets that are no longer future-proofed. And so that's how I look at it. I, I just don't think you can say, oh, I'm going to get another, you know, five, you know, $5 a square foot in rent or something like that. I think Good asset, you're going to get top of the market. And if you're looking at larger investors, they are always looking at, you know, where that asset fits in the market and whether or not it's future proofed. Yeah, Molly, that's great. Very, very helpful. Hey, Scott, Scott, did I get your last name right? And be honest, did I did I do okay with it? A plus. I think you did perfectly fine. Hey, perfectly fine. That's good. That's kind of like how I got through elementary school. Okay, so. Um, Tell us a little bit more about you, Scott. Sure. No, a pleasure. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be involved at SPX. And it's also been a pleasure meeting the uh, fellow panelists on this uh, plenary meeting. Uh, I'm just happy to be involved here. Um, my name is Scott Stogstill. I am from Ryan LLC. I'm the national leader of the Green Energy Incentives Group. Uh, I would say just kind of high level. Uh, I lead a multidisciplinary team that involves tax attorneys as well as engineers integrated into one team, basically trying to find you guys answers on uh, the federal IRA and just the constantly changing uh, regulations, or better yet, the IRS playbook on how they're going to audit these eventually on the back end. Um, for context, as far as Ryan goes, uh, last year in 2023, I think we uh, either were involved with the purchase or uh, selling of credits in the range of about $1.8 billion. Huh. And as we get into the end of this year, we're hoping to uh, break 3.8. So uh, I would say that that's a very big market. And I would say the biggest piece of that that's keeping us busy is just the due diligence 
that uh, investors are going to want if they're going to purchase these credits. Um, another piece that we're spending a lot of our time on, of course, is direct pay. Um, as far as my individual background, obviously, as I already said, I'm a tax attorney. I spent about 12 years. I've always been in tax incentives, but I spent the first 12 years of my career in a law firm environment. And then I flipped over to public accounting where I was uh, a principal uh, doing basically tax consulting like we're doing now. And ever since the IRA has been out, this has been my day job 24 seven. And, and even uh, through uh, the direct pay, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but when you're thinking IRA, you're not just thinking tax credits. You, I, I know that Ryan Group is really great at consulting about the federal IRA overall. You, you, you have experts that really understand that program well. Is that right, Scott? Correct. Yeah, my team covers everything from energy efficiency studies, such as 179D that gets into ASHRAE 90.1 and material science that goes into that, as well as the new mechanical equipment. Um, and then we cover everything over to what I would call the, what I would call say is a traditional renewable energy or clean energy generation, such as solar, mm -hmm. which again, in certain contexts, you have direct pay in other contexts, you have transferability. And then we also get into, or have been getting into uh, 45B clean hydrogen and some of this industrial stuff, because believe it or not, uh, the heavy lift on the uh, generation of electricity is still there. Uh, especially as we get, and I, we'll maybe talk about this later, but especially as we get into January 1st and beyond, we're in the 45Y, 48E regime, where we're going to have to uh, partner up with the Department of Energy and do these provisional emissions rating in order to do life cycle analysis of greenhouse gas. So I would say that's probably the biggest thing that I've been focusing on that is because come January 1st, that's a whole new regime we're going to have to deal with. Yeah, well, um, I, I speak for everybody listening in that it's good that we have you because I really have no clue what you were just referencing there. So it's good to know that you know what is out there and what to reference. So that's great. Scott, thank you for joining us. Elizabeth, I know you shared um, a little bit about uh, your work at, at, uh, at, at the DOE. Do you want to share a little bit about your background also? Sure, I'd love to. Thanks, Ash. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training. Uh, I started my career as a general tax lawyer, actually. Um, and then I got into the energy space working on some of the tax credit bonds and also on a project to create a securitization program for energy efficiency loans uh, in buildings, which is how I met Jager, who's the new now director of our division. Um, and I've worked at a New York Green Bank, which is a state ent entity very interested in supporting building decarbonization as well. Uh, and then came and worked on tax equity transactions on large scale renewables uh, for a West Coast law firm. So I, I like to joke that I am a currently recovering but frequently relapsing attorney. Um, it was sort of, I've been all around this uh, energy efficiency and renewables finance space for a number of years now. And uh, I actually currently split my time at LPO between our outreach and business development team, which works on things like this, um, speaking at events and helping develop early stage potential projects. And I'm now also half time on our underwriting origination team, which once the projects have come in, helps them actually get to commitment and close. So um, I think I have an, a nice view on our whole cycle now. Uh, and I've been here at LPO for a little over three years. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for sharing. Hey, Mark, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Now, now I know where to go to get tax advice, just to the panelists here. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, 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 do you want to share a little bit about your awesome experiences? Sure. Um, well, I guess my background goes back to uh, Lotus One Two Three when I was carrying a compact oh. computer, which was the size of a a big sewing machine with a little green screen to Pakistan, and using Lotus One Two Three to develop the national energy strategy for the state for the country of Pakistan. So. Oh my um, goodness! Wow. But, that that dates me, but you could do a lot with Lotus One Two Three, which then got subsumed, overtaken by Excel, as we know. Sure. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I have been in the kind of energy uh, resource conservation, sustainability uh, space for most of my career, and um, starting on electric utility rate issues, and then when I moved to Washington State, uh, uh, starting a consulting company called. Uh, Cascadia Consulting that worked on a whole bunch of 
started in the waste business and then worked extended out to sustainability broadly and ultimately climate action plans and and the the challenges and issues of the day. Uh, in the in the built space, that included um, helping the city of Seattle obtain funding for the ARA funded programs for deep energy efficiency and implementing a $20 million program on uh, called Community Power Works to really help people do deep, deep energy efficiency in their homes. You learn a lot about the difference between policy and implementation when you actually try to make something work with money that's available. Um, more recently, and I think why it's relevant here, I've worked, I worked on the Washington State uh, 2021 State Energy Strategy, which put forth our larger vision for how do we achieve our climate goals. Um, my focus was the electricity sector. I'm not a built environment expert, but if we're going to decarbonize the built environment, it's going to take a lot of electricity to do that. Um, and then last year, I worked with the Washington State Governor's Office. Really, I'm about following the money now because we have policies in place. We need money um, and help them develop a roadmap um, of findings and recommendations for how to bring as much money as possible from the federal government into the state for our to help us meet our, our clean energy resilience and other related goals, equity goals, and then help think about how we deploy deploy that money more effectively. So i um, been working on that um, since last year, and now I'm helping uh, stand up a thing called Fund Hub Wa, which is going to be a one-stop shopping uh, resource center on a website and then marketing and outreach, particularly to disadvantaged communities, those most in need, uh, those who, who have the least knowledge of these opportunities, so that you can go find across all the funding opportunities for climate, clean energy, resilience, uh, what what opportunities could work for you from a household to a business uh, to a, a, a local government um, uh, access federal and, and state funding for 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 those decarbonization activities. So that's going to go live, uh, I think, by the end of September, early October. Uh, and it's interesting to pull together all the elements of how to make that work and how to reach customers with that and uh, really make it easier for people to get this money that um that Ash was referring to that exists out there. Yeah, isn't it stunning that the combination of knowledge and access um, is, is really so important, particularly to disadvantaged communities uh, and smaller businesses. You know, they just, they don't have the time to do the same type of deep research um, that maybe some larger firms are, uh, you know, can do. So that's great. Mark and so end of September. So is that is that a website that's going to get launched and is it going to is it just going to pop up or are we going to hear about it somehow? I think you're going to hear about it. Fund Hub Wa, and we're yeah we're shooting for the end of September and and uh, we'll see how that works. And uh, organization called um, C plus C is managing the project and this is under the Department of Commerce, but it's really working across all the agencies in Washington and all the funding sources that tie into. Uh, you know, the clean energy, climate resilience, uh, and a little bit of natural resources space. And I think if it works in it and and we're able to be successful at it, we could expand it into, um, you know, one-stop shopping for many different funding opportunities. So we'll see how it goes. It's, you know, it's trying to be innovative. It's trying to bring the solutions to people and get them connected up, up to it. Again, with a focus on local governments and rural entities, which don't have the time to even look sometimes at the opportunities that are out there. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you, Mark. Um, really important work. Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start grilling each of these panelists here with a set of questions that last minute I've changed just to kind of keep them off balance. I have not told them I've changed all these questions, but now they're going to know that I've changed all the I'm just kidding. These are the same questions we talked about, team. But hey, um, I and it looks like people are using the Q&A function. That's great. And um, Mark D, what's the name of the new one-stop shop? We're going to answer a very simple question before I turn into my questions. I think you said it, but maybe you should say it a little slower. It's called Fund Hub Wa. Spell, spelled that way. Right. Fund, F, yeah, it's just like Hub H -U -B -Y. Fund F U N D D capital H U B W A. So a funding uh, hub -V. for Washington. Dot .gov or dot .org. I'm not quite sure what that decision sure, is yeah, made but, on. But we should keep our, great. Yeah. We should, yeah. we should, we should keep yeah. focused on that. Okay. 
Great. All right. Well, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, there's another question here that I think we can weave in. Um, uh, with the panelists' permission, I'd like to turn into some questions. I want to start with a, with, with one that I think maybe, Mark, you, you kind of set up a little bit, but yeah, there is so much out there. There's so much funding. There's so much um, that needs to be organized. Thank you, Mark, for articulating what you're, you've been working on. But if you're, if you're an owner, if you're somebody that has a building and you're managing it or you're building a building, um, most basic question, how do you start? What would you recommend uh, you do to start? And I'd, I'd like to start this question with Molly, and then I'd like to kind of move along and maybe ask a few other panelists the same question. Molly, how do you start? So I think that for new buildings, particularly uh, you know, in the Northwest, our current building codes and regulations are so clear on what you need to do that it's almost impossible not to get pretty darn close to a fairly efficient building. You just almost driven that. So that's that's sort of one piece on existing on new buildings. Um, on existing buildings, that's a different story. So we need to be really thinking about how do we look at those buildings. And from my perspective, if I look at building, or if I'm investing in a building or looking at an asset, I start to sort of do a three-dimensional analysis around it. Where is the risk? Where is the opportunity? And what can I sequence? So really simple things. I think we get so enamored with these big solutions that we forget that there's some really small solutions that we can look at. Um, so I would look at things like, you know, are we measuring what is happening first? Are we looking at, you know, start at the envelope, right? You're always going to be looking at how insulated is the building. What can I do on that perspective, right? You always start there. What's the lighting look like? What are the plug loads? Those are really simple solutions that can actually make a significant, make a significant difference in terms of um, how efficient a building is. And I think we try and make it a lot more complicated than it needs to be. Um, I, I do, I wanna sort of talk to this, this um, fund hub, which I may have gotten that wrong. But I think, I think Mark, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge right now. I mean, it, I liken some of, these, some of these bigger solutions to the way we look at um, you know, housing tax credit deals. You have to layer a capital stack and that is really complicated. And so if we can look at the look at the transaction in a way where we assume that it is not special, it's like any other deal. And if I can reduce my if I can reduce my operating costs, that means I have better net operating income, which means I can finance more. So I think we need to maybe step a bit away from thinking this is extra special and just assume that this is business as usual, which may not be the answer you're looking for. I mean, because it for me as a small a small business owner, if I'm a small, a small municipality, I don't have any idea where to go. And I think trying to decarbonize it from that perspective is really challenging. Not everybody can hire Scott, right? They can't necessarily afford the, those high-end tax attorneys. So we need to be able to look at these things in a slightly different fashion. Um, so. Great. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, Molly. No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I mean, I do. I mean, I, I we'll, we'll get when we start to talk and I really want to hear Scott talk about the different the different tax credits, the different things that are coming out of the IRA, because, you know, there's about 300, 360 billion. I might have 370 billion dollars that are just being funded. But when we start to talk about that, I have a high, I, you know, I have an example for a project that I'm working on on how I might layer those capital. But I'd like to have like, have that conversation first about what's out there first. And then I can start to I can give you an example of how I might analyze that. OK, great. Well, thank you. That's great. Well, let's do that. Let's take your recommendation and go to Scott. Again, Scott, you know, let's uh, Mo Molly set us up and said, okay, you identify the tactical solutions. You think about what to do for weatherization, lighting, and all that. But now you're in that funding space, and so you're some owner, and you're in that. Okay, how do I get this thing funded? Where do they start? How should they start to think about this topic? Great question. So I would say, obviously, from a, a finance perspective, you're you're going to try to find a way to get capital. Do you either already have it on hand? 
uh, or you're you're looking for an investor. And I would say that's, um, you know, and look, I mean, some of the more I would call or industrial oriented projects that we've worked on, it's exactly what you'd see in Silicon Valley. You know, they're they're running around trying to see if they can get investors, get uh, loans from a government, um, from a bank uh, or sometimes from the government. Um, and then you have the aspect that uh, due to direct pay and transferability, um, there's the probability of short term loans. I mean, for example, I was talking to a group of investors yesterday that uh, that's exactly what they were wanting to do. It's like, hey, let's try to nail this down as much as possible. Put this in a memo, something that I can share to investors or share to a bank. And uh, we're going to break out that, um, Ash, as you put it earlier, 30 to 50% that you might get off of a, an investment tax credit or whatever. Um, let's do that on a short-term loan. And, I, and look, I've had the same conversations with government entities, municipalities that are on the opposite end of the spectrum. You know, they're, they're not dealing in millions of dollars. Um, you know, for them, I would say a, a large project might equal 1 million uh, and, and no more uh, because that's all they have for investment. And, and as you know, Ash, I've done quite a bit of work with some of your municipalities, um, universities, hospitals, what I would call small projects. And that's exactly what's going on there. They're, they're also trying to figure out the finance piece. And again, usually it's going to be splitting the loan into two pieces. One is going to be long-term and the other one is going to be short-term. The short-term is going to be IRA that you plan to pay off in a year once it's placed in service. And then I would say the other piece is a little bit more long-term based off of you know what works for you financially. I think the big game changer though in the tax world with the IRA is some of the more upfront compliance work um, with you know, Commissioner Worley in there. I would I would say you know we kind of have a new sheriff in town, is the way I would like to call it. And I would say that there's some lessons learned from the employer retention credit and things that that went poorly with that. So as it stands right now, if you're wanting direct pay or you're wanting transferability, the IRS is going to do a pre-audit. Uh, there's this whole pre-file registration. There's a team from the IRS, the Department of Energy. There's a shared portal. And they're going to look at all these energy projects. They're going to want to know what bank account number it's going to go into and make sure. And they're going to audit that bank account and make sure that it actually belongs to the uh, you know entity that it actually belongs to. It, it actually belongs to uh, that particular municipality and uh, you know isn't a personal account of uh, Ashawat, right? So um, there are a lot of things that are upfront. And then you know I mentioned earlier about the provisional emissions rating for certain technologies that are that are coming into play. All of this is upfront, uh, which means if you're looking at the Inflation Reduction Act and trying to take advantage of some of those. You, you probably need to reach out, ask for help, probably get a consult on the front end. Um, if you're pretty certain about it, and if you're only going to use it on your own tax return, you're not planning to sell it, you're not planning to elect direct pay, then yeah, sure, you can wait and call us on the back end. But otherwise, I would say if you want some certainty on that and you want to get in front of the regulatory requirements, definitely talk to us earlier. And I didn't even bring up prevailing wage and apprenticeship and whether or not it's, it's you're gonna, exactly that's a, that's a heavy lift on that, right? <laughs> well, let me let me let me just let me just go back to yeah, this is sure. great, very helpful. But I just want to I want to um, and actually there was a question that was asked that I think maybe serves this part of the first dialogue we're having, which is how does someone get started? So they've done some technical assessment and we're trying to figure out how they get started. So are there resources? that you would direct them to you know mark earlier talked about how scattered the resources are which causes the state of washington to want to pull them together but scott wh where would you direct them on federal funding to learn more what what would you say to them right now if they're saying i want to know more about this yeah. what would you recommend they go do right now to learn more about what's available on the federal ira side for instance I would say start with the IRS websites and the Department of Energy websites. They both have areas that are built out for the Inflation Reduction Act. Beyond that, I have to say it gets complicated. And the, and the reason why is because we're in a world where the uh, regulations have not been fully published. Uh, over the last 18 months, we have been subjected to a new proposed reg or notice or other from the IRS and the DOE about every three to four weeks. Uh, yeah. meaning that it's been constantly changing. And even as we stand right now, just shy of two years of the IRA, we're still missing final recs. 
Um, and the IRS is still trying to figure out how they're going to handle these. And so um, now I will say uh, my team is trying to work on putting together a white paper and maybe build out a website that'll have, you know, kind of a, a, a way to walk through a lot of this. And that's something that's definitely on our to-do list. But unfortunately, I, I, I don't think this was intended. I think the Inflation Reduction Act was intended to help with the green energy transition. It's just, unfortunately, when you throw in bonuses, like we haven't even talked about the bonus credits issues uh, that that come into that, right? For if you if you live in an energy community, are you eligible to low income? And if you are eligible low income, is it category one or category two or category three? Right? I mean, there's so much involved yeah. with this. There's so many moving parts. I would say if if you are an investor wanting to get into this, I would say call a professional and walk through it. Um, hopefully, somebody that's up on what it seems to be like monthly changes and how this regime, and I think it's going to slow down going into next year. I, I, I don't want to paint too negative a picture because I think there's a little bit of a, a startup going on there. And I think the DOE and the IRS are doing the best they can to put up those regulations. Um, and right. for the most part that's been, been very helpful, but it, it's just, uh, it's, there's too many moving parts with the IRAs. That stands oh, I, right I now. appreciate, I appreciate that. Thank you. But maybe a couple of references Hey, Mark, sure. what, what just, I just want to go to you and then I want to move to the next question. You've done a lot of research. If someone was going to get started, for, you know, and I know that we're going to have this great website come up, but if someone's going to get started, they've done an audit of a building, they're trying to think about decarbonization, that they're trying to think about funding sources. Mark, what do you recommend they do to get started to kind of learn more to do? What, 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 what do you recommend they do? You know, I think the... Um... Immediately in our state, Washington State, I think the Department yeah. of Commerce has a, 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 a clean energy performance standard and a, and a staff that's there to um, provide incent to provide assistance and they've got some incentive programs. So reaching out to the Department of Commerce and finding their resources on the website, I think would be um, would be for a building owner would be a good place to start in Washington State. I can't really speak to other states. A couple other things that that we're doing in Washington State, which I think relate to this more broadly than just building owners, is um, the Department of Commerce has just issued a contract for uh, tax assistance. So um, smaller governments and NGOs, tribes and others can, can access um, uh, a contractor to get sort of an understanding of the things like direct pay and some of the issues, Scott, you were bringing up. Uh, so we don't, you don't need to go to the highest, you know, to, you, if you don't have the capital to, to pay, pay for your, your kind of service, there's going to be this service provided by the, um, by, by this contractor. So there's 4.5 million, no, there's 5 million in that, in that program um, coming online pretty soon here, that contract's just been let. And then um, for, Again, a lot of public entities can go after some of this public money and use it for the built environment um, upgrades and things. And there's a grant writing and grant assistance program that's also been funded and under contract and will be rolling out in the next couple of months for uh, those uh, smaller entities to be able to get help. Because, again, they don't necessarily even have time to go to the Fund Hub Wall website or to um, think that they can go after money or once they have money they don't feel like they have the resources they don't to actually manage uh, the implementation of, of that money so that's broadly across all the different topic areas here but a lot of those projects are could, could be built projects that the public sector is trying to upgrade their solar panels where i'm sitting right now the solar panels are old how do they get funding for mm -hmm. or that this is a nonprofit entity um there's green bank funding there's there's uh, various grant programs there's private private sources. So getting help with that is going to be a key piece. So I think in the media term, I think the, the government in Washington state can provide assistance to that to smaller entities. Um, you know, in the longer term, you know, the more types of intermediate resources we have to help people um, get this resources, the better. And that's really the focus of what I've been trying to help the state with. Right. And I think every state's got some version of Department of Commerce or Department yep. of Energy or something so that's another good idea is to actually look into the state 
uh, groups that might actually be able to help navigate or are getting more prepared to help navigate uh, different groups through this. So thank you, Mark. I, I think Elizabeth is going to go and help every, everything go faster in the on the, uh, the IRS. I was just going to ask if I could chime in on that. So yeah. We're actually, yeah. Go ahead. I'm not yeah. aware of a particular Washington State initiative in this regard, but we're seeing a number of states that are orchestrating programs to try to get economies of scale and facilitate smaller direct pay eligible recipients in doing some of these work projects. I'm seeing it more on the solar side than I am on the true kind of building efficiency plus type project so far, because those projects I think tend not to be as uniform and maybe not as easy to kind of uh, create a cookie cutter uh, approach to. Um, but I think there might be some programs coming out on things like solar for schools that could be an interesting model for how states might also be able to support some of the other uh, types of projects that that need need that kind of work. So just so you have the in that scenario, the state is often offering to own the systems on the facilities because it also can claim right the direct pay tax credit and then put together kind of a standardized RFP process where the local um, hosts can still have the say over its contractor and some of its mm -hmm. specs on the actual project, but within allowable limits that are set by the state program to create a certain amount of standardization. And then the state itself can seek the financing. Many of the states are actually going out and getting appropriated dollars to sort of build up front and then be able to get um, capital coming in once the construction risk has been mitigated and then using that to kind of keep the program going is, is sort of the, the construct I'm seeing. And I'd love to see some expansion of some of those ideas into the building decarb space as well. Um, the other one I would mention for somebody mentioned churches, I do, there are some um, groups that seem to have done a fair amount of work with, with churches that we are working with as potential borrowers sort of separate from the state as well. So I think people are acknowledging that this is a very real uh, compelling market opportunity uh, for from both a decarbonization and from a capitalist perspective, as Molly would put it, um, to, to to get some work done right now. Yeah, well, but by the way, let me keep following up. I have another question for you, Elizabeth, just that, that down this road. So let me, let me just try to summarize the first thing. So, so someone figures out technically what they want to do in a building and or in a development. And some of it's driven by code. There are a variety of different maybe funding sources out there, maybe the federal stuff is still maturing, Scott, it's maturing. So we're still trying to figure out how all that works. And so question was, do you need a professional? That was somebody's question in the Q&A. And the answer is at this point, you probably do need a professional, but there are resources that are available both at the state and federal level for you to start to do your research. But let's say you're developing a project and the project itself, Elizabeth, and I'm gonna use small numbers, although I don't find a million dollars to be small, but it's round. So you develop a project, technically it's a million dollars, it's got heat pumps, it's got solar, it's got some stuff in there that makes some sense to help get a building on the path of decarbonization. And in there, you're trying to figure out how to cover the million dollars. And so you talk to professionals, you do your research, you talk to utilities, you get some state funding, you get some federal funding finally figured out, and then there's a gap. You don't get it all done, there's a gap. So if you're out there and you're eventually maximizing as much grant dollars as you can, state, local, utility, what do you recommend can be done to fit the last bit of gap if you have no capital? Can you use private money, is there private money out there that's interested in these type of projects to actually fund and, and or own equipment? You'd mentioned a little bit that you sometimes look for the capital stacking in the virtual power plant thing. So how do you think at a smaller scale project level, someone should be thinking about how to fill the capital stack? Let's just say they get the grants, they get the professionals. What do they do with the last bit? Where else can they go to get the last bit of funding, financing, capital sources? What do you think? Well, first with the disclaimer that since our projects are usually a hundred billion plus, I tend not to get as deeply involved with the individual sites. And the way we get to those numbers, right, is by sure. saying, do a hundred of those $1 million projects over yeah. three years and put them all in one entity. And then we can figure out how to, how to support it. Um, but that said, 
when we come across situations like that, there's two approaches that we often take. One is I have a colleague at the loan programs office whose entire job it is to really understand the financing ecosystem for the types of projects that we would be able to support if they were big enough. And so one of my first calls when I have those challenges is, Carolyn, I have a capital stack that has a gap. Can you talk to these folks? And you know, is, do you have a suggestion? Um, the second thing is I'm seeing a lot of groups working with energy services agreements providers where the ESA company owns the assets, so they're doing the financing, and then the building owner isn't having to worry about the capital stack at all. Um, and I think that can be really compelling. As you mentioned early on, you've got alignment, right? The person who understands the system best is standing behind it and taking some of that risk and sharing the benefits with, with the site host. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um... Let me turn it over to the other panelists, just in case you have some additional things you'd like to add to how to fill the gap on the on the on some of the capital stack that is left. Molly, what do you think? So a couple of things um, on my project that I'm currently working on, we are actually looking at using CPACE financing, so commercial commercial property assessed clean energy, um, as a either a debt or an equity um, gap filler or a, you know adjunct. So that's one thing. Interest rates are about the same, but they're very focused on the savings that are coming from a traditional conventional pro uh, project versus a more efficient project. So we're looking at that. Um, there are also some other, you know, we haven't talked very specifically about some of these, uh, about some of the tax credits. So let me, so let me take this as my opportunity to sort of show you my sort of hypothetical um, mm -hmm. in terms of how we're looking at maybe a multifamily project. So again, maybe it's not a million dollars, but maybe it's 10 or something like that. Right now under the um, under the uh, 45L tax credits for high efficiency homes, that's been, that's been shifted to increase the number per unit. So not just re single family homes, but for multifamily homes to be um, $2,500 per unit. Um, to, if you meet certain energy star requirements. So if you have a hundred unit project and it's $2,500 per unit, that's a $250,000 tax credit, not a tax deduction, but a tax credit. So it's against your taxes. So that's a direct $250,000 benefit to my project. Um, you know, we can talk about the 179D uh, tax deduction. Again, that's a deduction. So, you know, maybe a you know, maybe about a, a third of your of your deduction. So that's three dollars and fifty cents for a per square foot per efficiency. So if that is a tax deduction, you know, maybe that's another hundred and hundred and thirty thousand dollars on that particular project. And then there's some other, you know, maybe we put some rooftop solar in, right? And we get a tax credit for that. Uh, so maybe that's Maybe that's, you know, if I put a $400,000 investment, maybe that equates to about one hundred and fifty dollars or $160,000 of tax credit. Again, so, so I'm starting to sort of look at how do I scale that. So there are ways to think about this maybe a little bit differently that even after the fact, Scott, I can go to my accountant and go, hey, I did all of these things. Can you get me some tax credits? Not upfront money, perhaps, Ash, uh, but but in terms of you know being able to put capital out, I think the CPACE is a great opportunity. I think some of the green the green bank green banks have some great capital. Some of the money that is coming through the greenhouse gas um, reduction fund from the federal government is being pushed out into the community development finance, the CDFIs. So your local your local banks, your local community banks, for example, will have that capital to put out there at a lower interest rate. Um, so there are different sources. Again, I would go back to looking at my project. If I'm looking at a project and I'm doing a rehab on something, it's going to be really hard to justify going out to some random place for capital. I kind of have to look at it as a, as a new mortgage or I need to put it on a line of credit or something like that. And to your point, I think your original question, is capital the constraint to decarbonization? No, I don't think capital is the constraint to decarbonization. What I think it is, is that we have a disparate, we have sources of capital that are out there, but we can't find them. We have no idea where they are. And I think there's a whole piece around education and training and capacity building at the, just at the contractor level. That to me is your biggest challenge to decarbonization is we're really fragmented. 
I, you know, I, I have to tell you, I wanted to do this panel, Molly, because I really wanted everybody to walk away just figuring out where the easy button was and all that. And between you and Scott, and you've, you've, you've kind of made this panel's goal that I had to be a lot harder. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. By the way, it is, it is absolutely the, true. It's, I, would, yeah, I would say ask us the same question next year, and the, hopefully well, the answer will be everything smoother, right? Okay. Well, I think Sorry. I think fun, I think Fund Hub Washington is an answer. I think I put in the I put in the chat. USGBC I think has a great website that has some resources on it. I think DOE and EPA also have a great their great pages on their websites that give you resources. But is there a one stop shop? The answer is no. There just isn't okay. right now, and it takes some level of expertise to find things, but it's out there. Yeah. Good, Molly. Thank you. That that's brilliant, and I love the way you just put that. Um, Scott, I want to I want to go back to you because Molly said something that I think is really super interesting. You know, the idea of when this funding shows up, assuming you can find it, it's going to get easier. But is that it's delayed? In other words, if you got a project and you're trying to actually get all the funding put together, it's delayed. We even had a question from someone that actually might be affiliated with some public entities where they might look at direct pay and, and even direct pay is delayed. In other words, the project has to get built, right? Is that right, Scott? And then you get the money. So right. how are you, are you, are, you know, Molly mentioned some ideas in terms of how it might happen in her world, but I'm, I'm curious, Scott, from your, from your experiences, what are you seeing from entities relative to this delayed satisfaction in terms of funding, how are they fitting the gap? And uh, what, what, what are you seeing entities do as they wait for the funding to show up? Are you seeing any clever things that you would wanna share with this group? Sure, yeah, uh, if you don't mind, maybe what I'll do is just share screen real quick of what I consider to be uh, a common conversation, especially when talking with uh, nonprofits and government entities about uh, direct pay, and, and that is that there's a timeline. Now, this was built earlier this year when um, TD9988 came out, so that's for the tax people. That's, that's kind of what our Bible of how we're handling direct pay and how the IRS is wanting to do this. But essentially, going into that first question, you have to wait till it's placed in service. That's step one. Uh, step two, there's a pre-file registration you have to do with the IRS. And by the way, the IRS is asking for four months to review and issue a registration number. Um, and there's quite a bit of data that goes into that. That was kind of what I mentioned earlier about, you know, bank account numbers. They want the geo coordinate of where that energy property is located down to the sixth decimal point. So that they, they want a whole bunch of little information. And this is again, reviewed by the DOE and IRS team. They issue a registration number. So that's step three. By the way, four months is what the IRS asked for. We are usually seeing closer to six weeks. It, it actually hasn't been anywhere near that long, but just kind of an FYI, it's out there. And then we get to the pro forma tax forms. That's the stuff that's going to go onto a tax return. And we have the whole issue of government entities that do not file taxes. They may if they have UBIT. But generally speaking, government in entities, agencies, we're talking about counties, universities, school districts, universities, a lot of these types of entities don't normally file a tax return or may not file a tax return if they don't do UBIT. And so now they're subject to filing a return for tax compliance purposes when they've never had to deal with that before. And that's kind of what we've done at Ryan to try to build out, just try to find, uh, yes, we do a lot of high net wealth investment. Um, you know, we do a lot of trading with those credits, which are usually 10 million plus, but we're also trying to find a way to help out. I, I, I've been a, I've sat on several board of directors for nonprofits, including uh, just recently rolling off as a vice council, vice president, local council, vice president for Boy Scouts. And um, I get it. You know, a lot of these nonprofits, a lot of these government entities don't have that money. So we're just trying to find a, a cheap, efficient, easy way of doing it. Um, now, unfortunately, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to what I would say the more complex technologies that CHPs, geothermals, that kind of stuff. But if we're talking solar, 
that uh, on my end, I'm not going to gouge anybody for those prices. Uh, it's going to be a simple flat fee that I think it would take to get it done. And Ash, as you know, I've been doing that with McKinstry, just trying to find a way to help these entities out because uh, especially if we're on the solar end, that's simple, that's easy. And, and we can get in and out and do that on a small fee, a relatively small fee. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that I, I think the question that was asked, and I think you think you've shared that steps and all that, if someone goes through all that process and then they're still waiting to get their funding. Oh, um, the timing. Yeah, get... so uh, tax returns yeah. filed. Uh, yeah. A lot of these credits are going to be over two million. Okay, so that's let's let's hold that for a second. But if it's below yeah. two million, I would say it's going to be your ordinary treasury process the tax return. Uh, you you guys know this from your own personal returns. Uh, twice a month, treasury it's used direct deposits, right? So it's just a matter of that happening. I would expect that to be maybe about two or three months max from when you file the return. Okay, yeah. if it's over 2 million, and this is what Elizabeth's already smiling because she knows what my answer is gonna be. That is JCT, that's Joint Committee Review. The Treasury cannot by law issue any check larger than $2 million without going through a uh, congressional JCT review. So that means it's on a consent agenda for whenever the joint committee gets around to reviewing it. And that may take up to six months. So with that, I just want to lay out there. If, if we're talking about some large dollars that are involved, that's a refund, that will be delayed. And that, and that threshold is 2 million or more. Gotcha. Okay. Well, and, and so therefore the, the gap financing or funding that is going to be required. You might get all the approvals to proceed, but you may yep. end up not getting the funding to pay your contractors or consultants. And so, but you have to get the job done to get the money. So Correct. you're in short term of, loan. That's the, that's the short, short term, term loan. Term. Yeah. Yeah. One gotcha. year, one year short term loan, um, you know, partner up with a, a, a bank or funding source that can give that one year and, gap. Uh, for a relatively low interest rate, uh, that would be my my recommendation. Okay, gotcha. All right. And Holly great. had her hands up, so she might well, she might have some other resources. Holly, go ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know that I have resources, but the, I look at it a little. I, this is great, and as a developer, I got to fund my project today. So here's how I look at it when I'm actually going out and looking for money. I look at my pro forma, and I say, so if I put this particular equipment in and I get this type of savings, what is the delta on my operating costs? So I tend to look at it very incrementally. If I'm if if I'm into your original question, Ash, green premium brown discount, if I am a if I'm building a class A building or I'm converting my you know class C building to a class B plus building, I'm now upgrading my building. So one, I have slightly increased rent than I currently have. Two, I have slightly lower operating costs than I currently have. Three, I no longer have the risk of having wildly volatile energy costs for my building because I'm not subject to whatever, you know, PGE's rate changes are or Seattle light changes are, whatever it is. I'm not, I'm not subject to those wild swings because my energy use is lower, right? So I'm starting to reduce my risk, slightly increased rent because of better building, slightly lower operating costs, less volatility, which means I've now lowered my risk, which means theoretically, I ought to be able to go to my traditional financing source and say, this building is a safer asset for you to invest in or to loan money to than you might have otherwise done. So if I can reduce my discount rate by a quarter percent, I can increase my rent a little per, little bit. I can reduce my operating cost by a little bit. That is a magnified impact on my net operating in, income at the bottom. So when I hand you my pro forma, my building is a higher value regardless. It, Molly, if I put it, oh, go ahead. Fred. Well, I was gonna say, if I put insulation on the outside of my building, so for yeah. those of you who actually do, who actually, you know, do understand how, you know, BOMA lease rates work, BOMA measures the, BOMA leases are measured to the outside of the building. Well, if I've now increased my insulation on my building, reducing my operating costs, I've also increased my rentable square footage by a small incremental amount. 
So again, my net operating income has gone up. So I think sometimes we get so enamored with great big solutions, we forget the small stuff that actually we can go to our regular bank and our regular investors and actually tell them, this is a better asset. This is why it's a better asset. And this is why you should actually fund me in a very traditional, conventional sense. Yeah, Molly, that's you know my soapbox. <laughs> no, no, no. You know what? I, you know what I actually love about what you're saying there, and I just want to—I want to channel back what I was trying to say earlier. You mentioned the word performa. You—you you essentially describe the financial inputs that you use to actually determine the financial viability of a project, and it's. It's sometimes it's uh, it's not yards, it's inches, it's changes, it's 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 the dialing it in part, and then it's the okay, what the, do the tax credits look like, or what does the utility incentive look like, and what the escalation rates look like? I mean, basically, you're really building out and doing that financial engineering, and when you do that, it starts to become more obvious what you might then be able to uh, put in to the model to actually either get it handled conventionally or if you're going to be leveraging other fee pace or pace kind of financing which there were some questions on uh, then you can also think about how all that comes together but i think what you described is something that i'm really glad you said out loud which is that you've got to not only build the technical model of what you're going to be putting in a building but you also really have to be well versed in the financial modeling. I think that's what I'm gathering from you. And I can't tell you how much I agree with you on that. Okay, look, I, I want to do a couple of things. Um, there's been some questions here. And I think that along the way, we've addressed some of these questions. Um, we tried to address the idea of direct pay and the timing. Uh, and you're going to have to figure out a bridge on that. I think we said, um, I think there are lots of trained professionals out there, but the demand for trained professionals to help guide building owners and others is going to continue to grow in this space. Uh, Scott has demonstrated that uh, by, and by explaining kind of how complicated the systems are. And I think there are groups that Elizabeth articulated and Mark articulated that are available out there. Uh, but wow, you sure do need some experts to help navigate through this process. Um, and that industry is up and coming. Uh, we just got to clip through a little bit more of these questions and just maybe say that I think we addressed a little bit of the PACE programs. Um, and I don't know if we're prepared to address the pros and cons of PACE programs um, right now, unless Molly, you want to say a word or two about that. But I think we got three minutes left and I just have one question for this group. This time has flown by. And I just, I just, I have two questions and I want you to answer either question. I want you to tell me, Molly already answered this question about capital constraints. Are they real? It's complex, but are those the issue right now uh, with regard to decarbonization? Or you can choose to answer this other question, which is uh, what type of innovation uh, might you be thinking is coming into the built environment? And again, we're going to go really quick lightning round. Elizabeth, what do you think? Is capital a constraint or not? Well, our applicants are telling us it's still a constraint, but I think it's more a question of constraint to, sh to sort of flesh out your project well enough to match with the capital out there and their constraints. Thank you. Perfect. Mark, what do you think? I think money is still a constraint, particularly for those most in need and um, and dis and disadvantaged communities. So, um, making this all easier is one piece of it, but there's still a need for 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 help there and 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 ways to make that work. Great, thank you, Mark Scott. What do you think? Is capital a constraint? You're, you're, we can't hear you, Scott. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, I agree that capital is part of the equation, but I think the long-term issue is going to be material science. Uh, we just don't have raw materials. We don't have the factories and that kind of stuff built out to do the grain transition the way people are wanting. And I think that's going to take time and it's going to be based off of science and material science. So I'm going to defer the DOE and hopefully we'll uh, have some growth going on there. So you think engineers are going to save the world? I understand. And that makes sense. You got it. Okay. Yeah. Mo Molly, uh, final word here before we wrap up. 
Uh, I think you already answered this. Is capital a constraint or are there other innovations that you think need to be worked through? I think other innovations. I think there are lots of great innovations. I think, frankly, capital is definitely a constraint, but more importantly to me, I think there's a whole education, awareness, and capacity building. Somebody asked a question about, you know, on the ground, do we have the people that can do it? And I can tell you that in a lot of the communities that I work in, we actually do not have the skilled workers who know what to do and to actually put it in place. I told Carrie and the team that this panel needed three hours to unpack this topic, <laughs> Carrie. And you only gave us 50 minutes or something like that. Hey, panelists, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I really wish I could spend more time with you personally. I'm, I'm learning a lot and I've got my, myself personally a bunch of questions. Please reach out to these people. They're awesome. They're available. I'm sorry to put you all on blast, but uh, if you have questions that, uh, you know, Please follow up. Carrie, thank you so much for letting this yeah. panel go oh, and panel. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you, Ash. Thank you to the thank panelists. You. What an awesome conversation. I think, um, yeah, we'll, we will get a lot of traction with the recording as well, but certainly could have had another two hours with you all. Um, so thanks so much. The conference. All right, see you <laughs> Bye. The conference will now adjourn to sponsor breakout rooms for the next 30 minutes. These should be visible in the Socio WebEx platform, but if you have any issue locating them or if you have any problems throughout the conference, please go to our conference website, www.sbxconference.org, and look at the agenda page. We have contact information there for people who can help you. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you again to the panelists. That was such a great conversation. We're so lucky to have had your expertise this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you all.